Welcome to Bet On It. It is NFL Week 8, and boy, do we have a show for you today. We've got some primetime games right here off the top. We're going to check in with VR, go through all those specialty segments and see if we can't find some barking dogs or some sandwiches or never mind. I'm just not going to say what Teddy brings to the table. Prop shop with Andy Lang, <laughs> TNA from Ralph, and uh, let's see if Joe Ranieri can't keep crushing those best bets. Let's get right into it off the top of the show. Marco D'Angelo is up first. We've got the Thursday night primetime game. Minnesota is a three-point dog at the LA Rams. Total around 48 on the Wager Talk odd screen, Marco. And uh, all I keep hearing about on this beautiful Wednesday is, Kelly, do you see what happens to teams after they play the Lions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I also lost last week with Minnesota. But <laughs> I'll get over that one by kickoff this Sunday. <laughs> well, here you'll have to get over by kickoff on Thursday because <laughs> this one is on Thursday night there, uh, mm-hmm. Kelly. And <laughs> looking at this one, Minnesota lost uh, for the first time, obviously, last week against Detroit. And the Vikings and Lions, what a game that was. I mean, they went back and forth the entire game. Minnesota scored twice in a 10-second span. They kicked a field goal and then two plays later have a scoop and score to take the lead in that game looks like they're going to win the game and no Detroit in the final uh, two minutes and 32 seconds goes down the field, gets a game winning field goal uh, with uh, under 20 seconds left in the game uh, just to rip the guts out of Minnesota. So to uh, quote our dear uh, friend, uh, Dave Koken, I got to be concerned about Minnesota losing the same game twice, the way they lost that one in gut-wrenching uh, fashion. And they got to do a quick turnaround. They got to play a Thursday night game. Kelly, we talk about these Thursday night games and the disadvantage that there is for the road team in these games. Well, I say it's not a big of a disadvantage when you're playing a division rival because you play them twice a year. You know what to prepare for. But you're not playing a division rival here. You're playing the Rams. Uh, You don't usually play them. So a bigger disadvantage for uh, Minnesota in this game. Uh, Rams also get the advantage of they're at home for the second week in a row. Um, They had a lackluster win last week against the imploding uh, Raiders, who shot themselves in the foot several times last week and managed to still escape with a five-point victory. I'm looking at this one. Uh, The Minnesota defense has held four of its six opponents to 17 points or less this year. And the two teams that did top 17 points, well, they were pretty good offenses, Detroit and Green Bay. I don't see a shootout in this game. The short week, the good defenses, I'm looking for a low-scoring game. And what sewed it up for me, uh, quote our buddies over, at the gold sheet since 2020, betting on road teams – who are outscoring their opponents by an average of four points or more on the season following a game where they've allowed 30 points or more since 2020, betting the under, you would have gone 33 and seven. That's a pretty powerful stat. I'm going to look at this one to go under the total here, and I'll throw in a little 1A wager. I lean to the Rams as well. Yeah. I also lean to the Rams. Marco, you're right. That Minnesota game was absolutely painful, and teams do often lose a game twice. But I'm with you. I lean towards the under. And uh, Teddy, another game. Well, I don't lean towards the under. Sunday night primetime, Dallas, four-and-a-half-point favorites at San Francisco. Lots of injuries to talk about on this one. Tell me your thoughts on Sunday night football. Yeah, San Fran, four and a half. There are some fours out there. Total has been bet down. It was 47 and a half. Now we're looking at 46 and a half for Dallas and San Fran. Of course, the markets can and will move throughout the week and before kickoffs. Always pay attention to what the markets are doing right now. But let's be real about San Francisco, okay? The Super Bowl loser was expected in general. You expect the Super Bowl loser to have a bad season. The regular season has been not pretty for Super Bowl losers. That's why it's something we talk about every offseason. And boy, lots of things are going wrong for San Fran right now. We're talking about a sub-500 football team. There are three wins this year. One came against the Jets. One came against the Pats. The third one came against the Seahawks when Seattle was skidding and it was on a short week. So it's not like San Fran's beating a whole lot of good teams. 
They have cluster injuries at wide receiver right now. Obviously, Brandon Ayuk uh, tore his ACL last week. And what we saw at the end of that game, let's see. They had Chris Conley, Ronnie Bell, Ricky Pearsall, and Jacob Cowing. That was their receiving coordinator last week. They might get Juwan Jennings back this week. They might not. They might get Debo Samuel back this week. They might not. If they get Jennings back, I'm not sure he's going to be 100%. Debo got uh, sick last week. But that's just the offense. And we're talking about Drake Greenlaw uh, missing, you know, on the defensive side. And uh, Hufanga missing and Hargrave missing. San Fran is in a world of hurt right now. Their offense isn't clicking. Their defense isn't clicking. They aren't beating good teams. And, oh, they're having special teams woes on a week-in, week-out basis as well. They allowed another Big return last week, a 55-yard punt return set up Kansas City second TD. This isn't a team I'm comfortable laying points with. We look at Dallas, and obviously Dallas had a pretty bad game before the bye week, to put it mildly. You know, getting blown out by Detroit at home. Prescott got benched by the fourth quarter. They allowed 184 rushing yards. They were minus five in turnovers. It was as ugly as it gets. The worst home loss since 1988. So what's Dallas doing here? They're getting out of town. They've had an extra week. <laughs> this is clearly a Dallas Cowboys spot against uh, what I feel is a flawed 49ers team. I'll take the points if I get involved in this one. I also will be taking the points, Teddy. Monday night primetime, the New York Giants, six and a half point dogs at the Pittsburgh Steelers. 36 and a half here, Joe. Pittsburgh, I don't know what to make of this team, right? They, uh, Tomlin goes in the press and is like, hey, this is why I get paid the big bucks. Rightfully so. I personally didn't understand the move to Russell Wilson. Does he turn into a pumpkin on Monday night? Yeah, well, this is a great game. Uh, if you've had trouble sleeping at all, uh, I would recommend this Monday night game. Just uh, cozy on up and turn this uh, bag of hot trash on. And I promise you'll be out quickly here. Uh, listen, uh, kudos to Russell Wilson. Uh, I think he performed better than I expected him to in that game. Uh, in the debut there, I thought he was uh, a little bit rusty, but certainly came on. But I still have my doubts about this offense of Pittsburgh. Keeping in mind, what, 62% of the passes he threw came within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. He wasn't great under pressure either. And you've got a Giants defense that ranks fifth in pass, uh, in pass rushing this season. Uh, they will be able to get to Russell Wilson, or at least keep the pressure on him, which means they're going to have to try to run the ball. They also have some issues on the offensive line. Uh, Zach Frazier, the center for Pittsburgh, uh, still very questionable as far as whether or not he is going to go in this game. His backup, Ryan McCollum, uh, was getting toasted uh, in that last game. And don't forget against the Jets, and don't forget Dexter Lawrence is who he's going to be going up against in this one. And we all know he can be an absolute wreck. Listen, they got some great pieces in the secondary, this Giants defense. They've been asked to do way too much. But we're talking about Danny Dimes here in prime time again, who Dable swears is his starting quarterback. Well, congratulations. I mean, he got benched uh, in the last game there because it was embarrassing. Why? Well, Andrew Thomas is out. So the Giants have their own offensive line issues. The Eagles uh, got to him, what, seven sacks in the game? Uh, what the hell is T.J. Watt going to do in this game? Listen, I am not running to the window to lay a touchdown with the Steelers and Russell Wilson because eventually I think we all think he's going to turn back into a pumpkin. But this total at 36, Cal, tells you everything that you need to know. I, this has got 17-10 written all over it. Sorry uh, if you're lucky even on that. So the only way I would look at this game is look towards an under, maybe even a Giants team total under, because I don't see it getting any better for Danny Dimes in this primetime matchup against the Steelers on the road. Yeah, I can't believe they thought uh, just a few short weeks ago this was going to be a good idea. Woo. Oh, well. Mm. Like Joe Ranieri says, it's going to be early for nap time mm. on Monday Night Football, which is great because I will be flying home from Kansas and maybe can catch a few Zs. <laughs> All right, guys, get every edition of the gold sheet through Super Bowl and every single daily edition of the basketball gold sheet through the NBA Finals right now for just $2.99. Visit wagertalk.com backslash gold sheet to purchase. From the gold sheet to the gold segment, it's time to check in with Yanni the Greek and see what he's got under that rainbow for us in NFL Week 8. 
A lot of good stuff, Kelly. But first, before we start, I just got to make sure everybody's wonging out there because the Wong teasers have been absolute fire if you're doing it the right way. And the right way simply means you wait until the line is at its most efficient. You want the strongest line possible, the kind of line that you can't beat, where the books believe that whether you bet team A or team B, you don't have an edge at lane 11 to 10. That's what you're hoping for because that's when the highest probability that the game's going to land near that number. And that's what we need to cash a teaser. So we don't want to bet them early in the week, even if the tease is available because that line may move as information filters in with injuries, with suspensions, with weather. There's a lot of reasons the line will change between each day. So if you wong on Tuesday and come Sunday when it kicks off, the number's no longer there where it's wongable. That's no long, that's not a wong teaser. You just you just bet a number earlier in the week for no reason at all. It's not at its most efficient. So if you waited until Sunday, an hour before kickoff, when we could conclude they are at their their, their strongest, here's what you would have done. It, it's pretty easy. What did I mark down? I have these marked down over here. You're 23 and six. You, you haven't lost a single bet the last three weeks. In fact, here it is. I just found it. Ready? We don't do anything in week one. In week two, we went three and two. Week three, we went four and two. Week four, we went five and two. Week five, we went five and oh. Week six, we went four and oh. Week seven, we went three and oh. Every single one of those 12 and oh, I gave out in the steam room for free the last three weeks without any handicapping, without anything at all. And in fact, I shared exactly how you should do it if it's a Sunday night game and a Monday night game. So we're going to do it for free this week again so I could share it one more time. I'm going to ask Johnny to make sure this week's steam room in the NFL is free so I could share this teaser information. You will be able to print money forever, forever until they change the odds on these teasers. So with that out of the way, let's dive into the NFL this week and start off with the Detroit. Actually, let's start off Thursday night football because we took the LA Rams plus the three. They took the three points on the LA Rams, then move on to Sunday. The look ahead was nine and a half on the Detroit Lions. So if you look at the line, it looks like the Lions got steam, but nothing could be further from the truth because since they've opened up 11, 11 and a half, there's been no sharp money on the Detroit Lions. In fact, I think most are waiting for that line to be bet up so they could come in the other way. Um, move on down to Baltimore, Cleveland, that total steamed over 42, steamed over 42 and a half, 43, 43 and a half, 44. That's where you saw a little resistance at 45, but that's normal. You should see that when an opener, a look ahead of 42 and by midweek, you're at 45, you're going to get some resistance. Don't let that scare you off. Indianapolis Colts game 269 plus six and a half and plus the six. Also total Atlanta, Tampa Bay under. That one's going against the public. So the fact that they did not wait for Sunday to try to get a better number tells you a lot. Under 49 and a half, under 48, Atlanta, Tampa Bay. 275, Chicago Bears at plus two and a half on the money line and at minus one and a half. So a lot of money on the Chicago Bears. They've been getting it done for the wise guys. They're not jumping off them just yet. New York Jets, New England, no surprise. They're going over the total there. One big hit at the opener of 38 and a half. That's why you're looking at 40 right now. Finally, Denver. This one's big. The look ahead was four. Books brought Denver out at seven. They pushed it through the key number of seven, hit the seven and a half, and hit the eight. So with absolute zero resistance on Denver, you're probably going to see some resistance if it gets up, especially to double digits. But don't let that scare you. You know what the move is, obvious, but most of us have left, lost the, uh, any kind of value there. Once it, the line moves that much, it's been extracted. Um, Two more to get to Sunday night. Dallas Cowboys, I believe that Sunday night game um, opener was uh, it took the look ahead. Sorry, was six and a half, and they even took the five there. And then Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh minus four and a half and minus five in Pittsburgh. That's what's going on as of Wednesday. But you want to check Sunday morning last call because that's when we'll know exactly which teams we're going to tease, and we'll know what information has been confirmed. Meaning there's no dummy up lines there's no setups no scalps no middles you know all that manipulation that goes on you're smarter than me so uh yeah i'll be back on sunday and as always love you kel thank you for uh having me on and uh, whether you follow or fade just do some damage hope you cash them don't trash them do some damage over at wagertalk.com wt.buzz backslash vr if you're looking for vr's premium picks all right so we got you guys some of the gold which means it's on to Maybe a sandwich game this week, or there could be a trap. You never know with that sneaky guy, Marco D'Angelo. Teddy's 
just the tip. My Barking Dog and Joe's Are You High Game of the Week. Marco D'Angelo serving up sandwiches. Good thing this is in the college football edition. We'll get to that in the other show. That's the NFL edition. So I'm going to let my comments slide until, well, about an hour from now. Marco D'Angelo, NFL sandwiches have been abundant this year. Tell me what you got cooking for this week. All right, Kelly. Hey, say hello to all the Kansas State uh, faithful when you're out there this weekend. Tell them I said hi. We'll talk about that more in the next show. Uh, (laughs) This is, well, the sandwich shop, I mean, I'll tell you what. People were outside the deli with signs, picketing, and everything else last week. Settle down, people, okay? Or to quote Aaron Rodgers, relax, relax, all right? Okay, mm-hmm. the deli took it on <laughs> took it on the chin last week. I know, but you know what? When I give a ugly sandwich and it loses, that doesn't mean you get to come in and complain about it because all last mm-hmm. year we were giving you those ugly sandwiches that were winning, and we were winning uh, prior to last week, but it was ugly last week. I'll 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 own it, no problem. But we're going to give you another ugly sandwich, and that's what the sandwich shop's going to find for you. It's situations that are not ideal. And I'm going to tell you a thing at the end of if you don't like the sandwich, you don't have to actually eat it. But if it gets you off the game and it saves you a loser from betting the other side, that's actually even more beneficial. Because if I give you a winner, you get one unit. If I save you a loser, you saved 1.1. So here we go with that ugly sandwich this week. I'm taking the Jacksonville Jaguars this week. It is the spot for them. We, I know it's ugly, and you've got to trust the scheduling spot. You've got Green Bay that just came off a big game against Houston Texans. Upstart team. Hot young quarterback, the whole nine yards, and they were in a dogfight last week. 24-22 final. They got the win. But look at who Green Bay's who they have on deck. It's their game of the season. They're going to have the showdown with Detroit next week. That'll put the winner of that game in the driver's seat in the division, and they can't help but not look past Jacksonville. Uh, Jacksonville, we know they've been a train wreck this year. Next to the Jets, is there been a more disappointing team through the first seven weeks of the season of what was expected coming in? No. So I get it, and I understand why uh, you may not want to get to the window on this one. But we've got Jacksonville returning from the two games in London. And the way the game started last week for Jacksonville, I thought they were going to be coming home with one less passenger on the plane, and that was going to be the head coach. But they rallied in the second quarter, put up, I think, like 22 unanswered points and went on to win. That can spark this team to maybe get a run going together. Uh, Jacksonville, uh, they have won two of their last three Even though they've been ugly, they have put two out of three together. They're back home, and they know it's a bad travel spot. They're coming back from London. If there's any team that knows how to handle the bad travel from London, it's Jacksonville. They do it every year, plus the fact they were over there for two weeks. So a little different getting acclimated over there and then returning back here. I'm going to look at this one. I'm going to look at Green Bay. They only had 277 yards of offense uh, last week and they had three turnovers. They do that this week, they're in big trouble. And that 5-2 and two record of Green Bay, although you know they've played well, I can't fault them. I just want to point out, they have had 17 takeaways this year. Think about that. 17 takeaways, that's helped this record. Now, is it a great defense or bad offense is going against them? We'll see. But I'm going to take the inflated number here, take Jacksonville plus the points at home, is this week's ugly sandwich game of the week. I can't wait to hear well, what Kelly I mean, has to say. It's not that ugly. At least they beat the Patriots last week, Marco. Like, it could be worse. They could have lost to the Patriots this week, and then you could be telling everybody to take them, and that would be even worse. All right, we'll get to you in the college segment of uh, – well, there's going to be a sandwich for Trapper getting it this week, Marco. Just know. Uh, yeah. Yes, are you high? Joe Ranieri and I spent the last few days together. We had a lot of fun mm-hmm. at the Tampa Bucks game. Well, that was until it went 10 uh, nothing to Baker Mayfield throwing a couple interceptions, and then I quit. 
Then I find out after the game, Joe Ranieri bet the Ravens. So then I was even more mad because nobody <laughs> would share that information with me. Yeah. Well, uh, so anyway, now I, I need to like zen out a little bit. Maybe smoke well, a little bit of something, take a nap, regroup. Joe we, Ranieri, um, which game is too I, high this we, week? I'm pretty sure the biggest Raven fans in the world that we were with there in Tampa, we were both screaming the over in the game as well because we didn't think it was high enough in that one. And we also last week told you we were way too high when it came to Philadelphia and the Giants because how in the hell, where were the points coming from the Giants? And, well, we were right about that one, but I think – Going to take a page out of Marco's favorite playbook of mine. We are, I have no intention whatsoever of watching an entire Miami versus Arizona game this week. So we are going to look only at a first half total that we think is just, well, it's too high at 23 and a half, given the fact that we have an Arizona in a horrific spot. They got to come out east now on short rest. After that last second Monday night win over the Chargers there, 17-15. Uh, to 15. Uh, Miami, and the big news in these parts that we I've been getting buzzed at all morning long is the fact that uh, Tua, they are hoping, is going to clear the protocol, but he is planning on practicing this week and in all likelihood uh, will give it a go finally. But uh, that would be great news for Miami given the fact that Huntley uh, was lost in that game last week, which means Tim Boyle. Could be your quarterback. That's right. Tim Boyle could be the quarterback for Miami if Tua is not cleared. But let's just go on to the assumption that Tua is cleared. Uh, that's good news for Miami because uh, Miami with Tua and without Tua are night and day. But the reason we're going to go in the first half is, A, we don't like the situation for Arizona, nor do we like the situation offensively for Arizona in this one. Uh, Miami's defense has really stepped it up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they are, have allowed just 285 yards per game. You've got an Arizona team that I don't know what the hell is going on with the offensive coordinator for Arizona, but if somebody can explain to me why, um, why their stud wide receiver Harrison jr. Hasn't topped 50 yards receiving in any of the last four games they have played. Uh, you gotta be kidding me. Now they do run the ball well and Miami's biggest, inefficiency on defense is against the run. So I don't think they're going to drop back in any way, shape, or form and try to throw the ball in this Miami defense. I think they're going to concentrate on running. And Tua, there is going to be some rust. This entire offense runs on rhythm and timing, and he's been nowhere near the football field to have any of that. So I do think it's going to there's going to be an adjustment period here for Miami. Hate the spot for Arizona. Like the spot for Miami, uh, who I think if Tua plays will eventually figure it out by the time we get to the fourth quarter. But there is no way I'm expecting 24 points or more in the first half of this game. I think it's going to be a snooze fest early. And hopefully if Tua figures it out and he's still standing, uh, then yes, I believe points may be coming in the second half, but definitely not early. So I'm on the first half under in this Miami-Arizona game, plus the weather Keep an eye on it. It's supposed to be 15 to 20 mile an hour wind gusts in South Florida on Sunday. Joe Ranieri, the meteorologist. Mm. I like it. <laughs> Teddy covers just the tip. Who are we buying or selling on this week or in the weeks to come? Sure. Let's talk a little just the tip. Buy, sell, stock watch for the NFL and I'm going to talk about the team that currently has the single best point spread record in the league. That team's the Indianapolis Colts, six and one ATS, the best point spread team in the team in the the best point spread team in the league. And right here, I want to fade Indy moving forward. There's five pieces to this thought process. First, let's talk about Anthony Richardson versus Joe Flacco. It's clear if you watched Indy this year, they're better on offense when Joe Flacco is behind center. Richardson has a unique skill set, all right? It's not a Super Bowl team this year. His running-throwing combo, I mean, there's only two names that come to mind, Mike Vick and Lamar Jackson, you know, as that level of eliteness, but he's not elite now. You have to play the guy, not the aging vet. I get it, but we're talking about Anthony Richardson, you know, 10 of 24 for a buck 29 last week. Missed a bunch of throws, and he was the team's leading rusher as well. So it's not like this offense is clicking on all cylinders, with their starting QB ahead of their backup. Richardson, the QB of the future. Most of this success has come with Flacco behind center. Second, 
They're six and one ATS, four and one straight up the last five. All four wins coming by less than a touchdown. When you have a team that's winning games and covering point spreads, what happens? They get a little bit of a betting bandwagon. More support for Indy than I expected to see. I'm not convinced that bandwagon holds. Third, their strength of schedule, you look at it on paper, wow, that looks really good. They played the Texans, the Packers, the Bears, the Steelers the first four weeks. They stepped down the last three weeks, the Jags, Titans, and Dolphins, but overall, that was weak Miami, not strong Miami. Uh, but, you know, I had, I had people telling me this team was good <laughs> out and about this week. And I'm not buying it, all right? Their strength of schedule is okay, but the fact that they played some quality teams, I think people are thinking Indy's better than they are because they've covered these numbers. Fourth, this defense is a prop, okay? Make no mistake about it. They're outside the top 20 in yards per play allowed, yards per rush allowed, yards per pass attempt allowed. They have six defensive players on IR, including three starters from the defensive line. Miami can't throw the football. Last week, they allowed 188 rushing yards to Miami. This is not a good defense. And last but not least, we got to talk about their upcoming schedule. They play the, at the Texans this week, at Minnesota next week. They have Buffalo at home, at the Jets, and then the Lions. Step up, step up, step up games. All good defenses against the weaker of the two QBs. I think there's money to be made betting against the best point spread team in the league over the course of the next month. Let's start fading in. Oh, boy. I didn't want to hear that. Not mm. for my futures bet. Mm. And uh, that's okay. It's already losing anyway because Houston is the best team in the league. But we'll get to that at the end of the show. Right now it's time for a barking dog. And I went back and forth on who I really wanted my barking dog to be because a lot of them were really gross. They might as well have ended up in Marco's sandwich segment. Ooh. The idea of the barking dog is can the dog actually win the game outright? And then I decided to make the dog my best bet. And then I went back and forth between another dog and I thought, Okay, fine. I'll take the Raiders. What? No way. Chiefs fans are going to hate me. Um, Look, I'm just going to say this point blank. Teddy talked about the 49ers and how they really weren't that good. I didn't understand all the 49ers love last week. I kind of agreed with laying the one and a half and very glad that I didn't do so. What did we see? Patrick Mahomes, 16 passes, 154 yards. He ran the ball, had one score. Kareem Hunt had a better game. And now I wake up on this beautiful Wednesday morning to hear that DeAndre Hopkins is going to Kansas City and everybody loses their minds. Everybody's convinced Kansas City's just going to win the Super Bowl again. But I don't think the Chiefs are the best team in the league. And I understand they're probably going to dominate this team. But if the Raiders play a flawless game, we know they can beat Kansas City. Don't forget, they did it last year. What was that, week 16 in Kansas City? Gardner Minshew doesn't throw three interceptions. Then maybe this team can keep it within the double, double digits. I like what we're seeing from Brock Bowers. He's going to be a tight end to reckon with in the NFL for years to come. Again, expecting this divisional home dog to get up and play for their coach. Max Crosby literally said, I will not be playing for the Raiders unless Antonio Pierce is my head coach. These guys want to win from him, for him, and they wanted to win last week. It was very apparent, even though they didn't get the job done. I know. A lot of people are going to say, oh, you're just a Chiefs hater. No, but 10 points is too many to be laying on the road with them. Give me the Raiders plus 10 and a half. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't want to sprinkle a little bit on the money line before the Chiefs go play Tampa Bay and then Denver and then Buffalo. You think they really care about this lowly Raiders team on a three-game win streak? I think not. All right, we got rid of the prop shop graphic because now the doctor is in. The proptologist, Andy Lang, he has a stethoscope. He's ready to get a uh, heartbeat on today's fast prop bet. Yep, taking the temperature of the room. Got a pulse on the action here, Kelly. Let's go with Aaron Jones on Thursday Night Football. Over 68 and a half yards rushing. This is a really good matchup for him, and I, I did not expect him to play as much as he did last week. So really nice game against the Detroit Lions, who are a really good rush defense. He had 14 carries for 93 yards. Uh, he's had 85 carries for 443 yards this year, Kelly. That's 5.2 yards per carry. So he's getting it done, uh, and he's gets a, he gets a really good matchup against the Rams. This is a Rams defense that has very very much struggled. They're 18th against the pass. 
uh, but they're 30th against the run. They are giving up 151.7 yards per game. Every single running back that they faced has gone over this total, including Alexander Madison from last week. Uh, Josh Jacobs has gone over. DeAndre Swift, Jordan Mason, uh, James Conner, and David Montgomery. So in every single game, a running back has gone over this total here. So I'm pretty surprised at 68 and a half. Feels like a really nice week to run the ball a lot. You're coming off a short week. You're coming off of a big game against Detroit, against a Rams team that has just really struggled to do anything uh, to stop the run. So let's roll with Aaron Jones on Thursday Night Football over 68 and a half yards rushing. And as always, Kelly, take two of these and call me in the morning. <laughs> well, instead of seeing a proptologist, I guess I need to go see an optometrist, Andy Lang. I'll see you next week. Always appreciate your contributions here on Bet on It. At Bump Sports on Twitter, at Andy Lang Bets. He does a ton of stuff on the Wager Talk Instagram channel as well. All right, the glasses mean one thing. Time for some trends and angles. And Ralph, this was one that was on my long list. I ultimately did not get to the window with this team, but tell me why you like the Cowboys plus four and a half. Well, Kelly, no matter how bad a team looks last week, that causes a public overreaction, and this is clearly the case. So let's start off with this Dallas Cowboy video. By the way, we are backing the Dallas Cowboys plus the points. When I went and looked at the database, this goes all the way back to 2001, when an NFL team is off a loss of 35 points or more, there's only a handful every year, and they're off a home loss by 35 points or more. Those teams are 76.5% against the spread. NFL players are prideful. Getting blown out is an embarrassment. Getting blown out at home against Detroit is an embarrassment, and now you get a national TV spotlight to try to bounce back. On Wager Talk today, I've had many charts about post buys, and we know that post buys are not always the positive people think they are. But if you are on the road off a buy and off a loss as a favorite or a dog up to plus seven, you are 66% against the spread since 2012. And by the way, Sunday night, home favorites in the NFL since 2019 are only 44.1% against the spread. All those line up with Dallas. Now we look at Dallas's current performance. Was that a horrible loss against Detroit? Well, yeah, a 38 point loss is horrible. Getting out gained by 241 points is, is horrible, but they were minus three turnovers. If you're an NFL team and you're minus three turnovers and you're down 27 at six at the half, you are out of your game plan, and you cannot run the offense you want to run. I look at San Francisco. San Francisco comes in at 3-4 and four on the year. How surprising is that? The Kansas City loss, not a bad loss. The Seattle win prior is by far their best win of the season because the other two wins were home against the Jets and home against New England. But we have to note in that Seattle game, they were plus three turnovers. So San Francisco's best win on the season was because they were plus three turnovers. Dallas's worst loss of the season is because they were minus four turnovers. Those are the type of situations I like to look to circle. And when we look at Dallas, their run D was horrendous in their three losses. They allowed 184, 190, and 274 yards. In their three wins, they held all three opponents to 100 yards or less. I think Dallas does come to play. I think they're a prideful unit. And while San Fran, again, is a prideful team and coming off a loss in a Super Bowl rematch, look at their schedule. They had to go to Seattle, then they have to host KC, then they host Dallas, then they got Tampa Bay and Seattle again on deck. And San Fran is a banged up team. You know, we know Ayuk is out for the year. Samuel with a pneumonia may be back. Kittle still banged up. Their other two receivers are banged up. Too many cluster injuries for the 49ers. Give me Dallas plus the points. I'll call for the outright upset. Outright upset from Mr. Ralph Michaels. You guys can follow him on Cal Sports LV on X and at Ralph Michaels WT on Instagram. He's been putting out a ton of great stuff over there as well. If you guys are looking for more TNA, head over to the Wager Talk Instagram channel, wt.buzz backslash rm. Of course, you can get Ralph's premium plays 
These glasses are giving me a headache, which means I'm ready to end the show, which means it's time for Best Bets. It would appear Marco D'Angelo is going for every ugly dog on the board, including my Raiders pick, because uh, this one's pretty gross, Marco. Let's talk about it. Hey, Kelly, it's, you know, quarter to two, you know, back in the old days when the bars closed at two, you know, when I lived in Pittsburgh, you know, they look a little bit prettier at a quarter to two. <laughs> All right. All right. So here we go. We're taking Washington plus the points this week. And, you know, there's so many things done pack here with this game. Let's start with the, the first thing. Obviously, uh, Jaden Daniels, uh, you know, Hart, and we're looking at a line adjustment. So you're going to tell me that a rookie quarterback with seven career starts, not really seven because it was six and maybe a quarter before he got hurt on Sunday, is worth four points in the market. That's what the market is trying to tell us because you've got uh, Washington that went from uh, favorite to now a two and a half point. Well, actually, uh, we're looking at a five point change here now uh, because it was, the early number was Washington minus two and a half. And now we got Chicago up to two and a half. This is a spot where I just think we're too many points with the adjustment. Now let's look at the second part of it. Everybody's talking about Chicago and the three-game winning streak. They're talking about how powerful the NFC North is. It's the best division in football. It may well be. I can't argue that. But let's just pump the brakes on everybody running to get their playoff tickets with the Chicago Bears. Let's look at the three teams that Chicago has beaten. Start the winning streak with the L.A. Rams. They caught the Rams decimated with injuries and the week after they upset San Francisco. That was a huge game for uh, the Rams pulling off the win over San Francisco, and then they're going to Chicago uh, all it banged up and injured. That was a great spot for Chicago. Then they win against Carolina. Okay, what do we got to say about Carolina? We know how bad this team is. They got a statue of a quarterback uh, in Andy Dalton back there right now. And then they beat Jacksonville over in London. And we've talked numerous times about the disappointment uh, with the Jacksonville Jaguars this year, how they have underachieved. So I'm not sold on that three-game winning streak. Now let's talk about the injury. There was a reason Washington – signed Marcus Mariota as the backup for this team. The reason being is he is the perfect backup for this offense and what they're running. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury's offense has been unstoppable this year. Now, granted, Daniels gets all the credit for that, but how many times have we seen a quarterback leave a lineup, get hurt, insert another quarterback, and they don't miss a beat? It's because it's the system. Now, I am not taking anything away from Jaden Daniels. I think he is the real deal. But Marcus Mariota came in and was 18 of 23 for over 200 yards in relief. More importantly, he ran the football 11 times. This is a motion offense. He uses the quarterback in motion, throw on the run, run with the football. He, granted, Mariota is not Daniels, but he is not a statue back there. And that's why he's there to run this offense. In Chicago, Caleb Williams laying points on the road. Are we getting carried away here? I think so. I am going to take Washington plus the points. Let's throw in the injured player theory. How many times have we seen this happen? The rest of the team rises to the occasion when they lose a star player. And we're getting a backup that is a former starter. It's not like we're getting an inexperienced backup. I think Washington will be just fine this week. And Throw in one more angle that I like to talk about. That three-game winning streak, they're coming off a bye. How many times have I told you? The last thing you want to do whenever you have momentum is not play. You go into the bye week on a roll, it's a momentum stopper. You go into the bye week when things are bad, yeah, you're going to fix everything that's broken and come out with a new vigor in the next game. I look for Chicago to go down this week. I am taking Washington, and we're grabbing the points. Uh, obviously, with a small number, I'm telling you to sprinkle as well. I'm taking the Washington Commanders on Sunday. Very good point there, Marco. That would be what happened to my best bet last week is uh, coming after that bye week. Joe Ranieri laying a little short favorite here. 
with the Atlanta Falcons. Tell me why. I I hate doing this, uh, Cal, but if I didn't see it with my own eyes a couple of days ago, uh, this has got, they got big problems, Tampa Bay, right now. Uh, Let's start with the defense. First of all, their pass defense is horrific. Uh, They gave up, and I mean wide open touchdowns in that game, making Lamar Jackson uh, look unbelievable throwing the ball. I believe five touchdown passes altogether is what he ended up having uh, in that game there. Not to mention Baker Mayfield look a lot more like the Baker Mayfield we all know and love. And I think it's going to get only worse from there after they lost Evans early in that game, which changed the whole dynamic of what they were able to do throwing the ball. And then, of course, in a game that was out of reach, they left Godwin in, and wouldn't you know it, he's now gone for the season, which means we've got tight end Otten, the only guy left. Now, we did see this game, a first go around in Atlanta, and that was the game in which we watched Kirk Cousins throw for a record 509 yards. And I'm telling you, Tampa Bay's defense is looking worse by the minute and I don't even consider Baltimore a great throwing team none of us do uh they are a much better running football team but Atlanta didn't try to run much why because they threw for 509 yards if it ain't broke they ain't gonna fix it the difference between that matchup and this one is that I don't know how Tampa keeps up with the offense of Atlanta who's coming off of what was a terrible flat spot and they looked it in that last game. Now they've got to go to Tampa. It's never easy backing a road favorite at this point, but I just expect Atlanta to load up, try to stop the run here in Tampa, dare Mayfield to find his third, fourth, and fifth receivers at this point because their top two guys are gone. I do think he's got five interceptions in the last two games. I think they're going to get, he's going to add one or two more to this one here, Cal. I think ultimately... Atlanta in a bounce back spot uh, under a field goal here. I like them to win this game. I think they take a stronghold of this division. I think they can make a statement with it. And I'm sorry, it's just too much for me to have to count on Baker Mayfield with a bunch of, uh, you know, third, fourth, and fifth receivers here. I'm not buying it. I think Atlanta gets it done. And I think Atlanta uh, takes their first step to securing this uh, division crown. All right, Atlanta to win the division. Joe Ranieri says it's worth a sprinkle. If you have it available on one of your books, maybe he didn't say that, but he definitely inferred it. Teddy Mm -hmm. Covers. Are you sucking up to our producer, Dan, with this one? I don't get it. I don't get the rationale here. Tell me why you like the Eagles. No, in my mind, it's it's, it's a no-brainer, all right? Let's start with the Cincinnati piece of the equation. We did, of course, came through with a live underdog last week, uh... Seattle plus the points was never in doubt in that ball game, and I don't think that this one's going to be a sweat either. I'm going to start with the Cincinnati piece of the equation. All right, Cincinnati is a three and four team. Their three wins have come against the Giants, the Panthers, and the Browns. Arguably the three worst offensive teams in the league. They're not beating anybody. All right, last week they had a kick return touchdown in the opening play of the game and then proceeded to gain 12 first downs, 223 total yards, one of 12 on third, or sorry, two of 13 on third downs, 4.2 yards per play. This is not a good offense. Their defense isn't any good either. <laughs> and again, they've gotten to face three of the weakest offenses in the league. Any decent offense, move the ball up and down the field against the Bengals. I'm confident that Cincinnati right now is being power rated a little bit too high compared to how they're actually playing and how good the team actually is. We look at the Philadelphia piece of the equation and know the markets aren't high on the Phillies, on the Eagles right now. You know, the the market's been crashing on that. That's the only reason they're dogs in this ballgame. They had 269 rushing yards last week against a pretty stout uh, Giants front seven. And I think they can control the line of scrimmage on both sides of the football here. What's Philly's strength? In the trenches, offensive line, defensive line. Where's Cincy's weakness? In the trenches, offensive line, defensive line. This is a defense that allowed 2.2 yards per play last week. Their top 10 yards per play full season. And my power rating and rating numbers are very clear. Philly is the better of these two teams. They're catching points. Count me in. I want the Eagles at the plus price. And yeah, Marco likes to sprinkle. Misses a sprinkle as well. 
Philly plus the points and on the money line against Cincinnati. I might your bet just sprinkle them in a teaser. We'll see what it looks like on Sunday morning there, Teddy. But yes, good call. Last week with the Sea Chickens. Let's see mm. if he can run it back this weekend with the other birds. I uh, was not happy to hear in uh, Teddy's Just the Tip segment that he wanted to sell the Indianapolis Colts because they are my best bet this week. Tell me there's not a sharper line in the NFL than the five and a half point underdogs, hmm. especially in the division. I thought this Texans team would take a step back, ultimately, that the division would go to the Colts. And while that has not come to fruition yet. It's not out of the complete realm of possibility if the Colts can win this football game. And while I like C.J. Stroud, the guy made me a lot of money last year, they are not the team to blow the Colts out. Yes, Houston has won three of the last four, including winning by two week one in Indianapolis, but this is the largest spread they have had in several years. In the last four matchups, every single one has been under a field goal. Prior to that, Indianapolis was favored in five straight. So let's look at the Colts as 4-0 against the spreads as underdogs this season with two outright wins. Ding, 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 ding. We're going to take the five and a half. And, of course, sprinkle a little bit on that money line. Again, I have not been that impressed with this Texans team. I think the Colts do have the horses to get the outright win in Houston. Thank you to all of you guys for every single week hanging us out here on Bet On It. Make sure you guys hit that like button. I know I did not nag you enough during the show, so please do that for me. Hit subscribe. We just hit 180,000 <laughs> subscribers on the Wager Talk YouTube channel. If you're watching us on one of our other various platforms, give us a like there too, because we are here for each and every one of you every single week. Marco D'Angelo, Joe Ranieri, Teddy Covers, Ralph Michaels, Andy Lang. By the way, that is his legal name I found out today Ooh. in between segments. And uh, of course, Yanni the Greek. I don't know if that's his legal name, but maybe we'll find out <laughs> on uh, a different edition of Bet On It. Thank you guys. As always, good luck this week. Until next week, let's bet on it.